So it was already pointed out that I'm a crystallographer, so I'm not a chemist. I'm actually more or less a physicist. I'm not a biologist. I'm not a medical person. I can't rescue you if you've got a heart attack. And I can't rescue you if you get a second one. So, um, since I'm virtually blind with glasses, and the same without, <coughs> you see this slide. And it basically points out what it is about. It's about a paper I wrote on request of some colleagues from a company, which makes it a little bit tricky. If you ever have worked with a company, they first want you to have a non-disclosure agreement, and then you ask them questions. And as a result of the non-disclosure agreement, they don't tell you anything. <laughs> then you ask a question again, and then they might tell you a little. So the process of working with them can take some time. So this work actually started two and a half years ago. I was approached by a colleague, Jan Orban, who is a Czech and a notorious non-drinker of beer and wine. And they work in a company making stuff out of beer. Oh. Then Clinton Dahlberg is another colleague, and Brian G. Carroll is a former co um, student of the University of Washington, a uh, graduate student, made his PhD, and worked in this kind of field as a project manager. So I'm from the chemistry department, but I'm not a chemist. This paper we wrote is about beer and about hops in beer. And so I was told not to ask you <laughs> what is beer made of because you know that. But you might want to be particular certain about the fact that different countries have different laws how you make beer. So here the laws are not there. But there in Germany they are and you would not find sugar or honey or spices in the so-called classical beers. Um, I, I wrote down here a little bit of a recipe I found online of those people here in uh, America trying to make the brand of beer that I grew up with. And you say, oh, is that possible? Uh, well, Germany, you don't have the 21 uh, age year limit. Um, and as a result, um, I got used to a style of beer that is more like a lager. Looks a little bit more yellowish than this one here. It's made with yeast that stays on top of the brew. And in Cologne they make a big joint, uh, or kind of joy of saying it's obergerisch, which in Germany means two things. It, it's it's um, uh, doing a fermentation from the top, but it's also superior. So it's a kind of a nice marketing gag. So you have to see what these things mean. Um, and you see the routine of doing this is pretty complicated. I simplified the recipe, which is uh, the ingredients are having a ton of different hops and different malts in it. And I figured out that the main ingredient is actually water. Um, so whatever you think is in beer, most of it is water. But the rest is much more interesting. Beer is better drink drunk from cold. Um, I'm a German, so sometimes the words come out a little bit funny. And uh, that makes it a little bit difficult for Germans to work in Oxford, where I come from, where beer is actually not cooled down, um, which uh, causes some trouble for those people who are used to cold beer, especially in deep summer. So let's go a little bit to what makes beer taste bitter. Now that's the hops in it. Um, hops is an interesting word, actually. Nobody has figured out really where it comes from. Uh, the chemelon, the word stems from the Czech chemelon, which stems from somewhere else out of Asia, or deep Asia, 10,000 years ago, where they already used hops to make beer. So one of the particular things about hops is that it enhances the beer making, and hints of that are given in the literature the name Humulon uh, Lupulus comes from Rome at these times where they found it among trees growing wild like vines and they're not welcome plants at that time. Uh, the name hop itself may come from the Norwegian hop which means cone but 
Why should something that comes from Asia through SEC have a name coming from Norway? I don't know. You have to tell me. So, uh, uh, dear lady Hildegard of Bingen, maybe you can hear something of that. Ah, I hear something singing. That's her. She's a bit older than that. She was pretty keen on understanding a lot of things, not only how to make the first written down music that we know of of a female componist, uh, composer, but uh, she also knew a little bit about everything. She actually was appointed a doctor of the church two weeks before we submitted our paper, which you just in the, saw in the beginning. So it's kind of a recent event, although she lived a few years ago. And in interesting that hops as such although it is so good for beer, was banned. Now you would think, how well you could do this? Um, banned by Henry VIII because of adulteration, so the master of adultery. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but there, there are political reasons and tax reasons of this. So there were two kind of competing brands of beer making. One was called ale, it was spiced, and then there was beer that used hops. And depending on where the taxes lay, uh, so some kings or noble people put a tax on, say, putting hops into the mild brew, then the people would make ale, because it was then cheaper. And then the lord would change his tactics, and they would make beer again. All the question of time. Well, Anne Boleyn's and Henry VII's uh, son, Edward VI, then reinstated um, the hops in beer, pointing out, as a 15-year-old, uh, that is notably healthy and uh, temperate. I guess he had some experience. That wouldn't be possible in some countries of this world. It was certainly possible in Germany. Well, if you want to s get a little bit more reading about this, there's a very nice summary where you have not to read through a book to get all the different uh, facts about this on a web page, so I leave this open for someone who wants to write it down, written down, great. You can always come to me. So you see, hops as such uh, is coming from an interesting family of plants. So everybody who brews beer knows that, and he brings it in his talk at the right moment when the people are really tense. Um, and, and the question is, why put people hops actually into beer in the first place? Um, well, it has a couple of features. Um, it has no feature of cannabis or hemp, so to make sure of that. It just is a good cousin of all these other noble plants. Um, but it works antibacterially, because you really want to grow your beer without a big mushroom growing out of it as well. Um, it preserves, which is a bit more tricky to talk about because preservation means beer stays as it is. Um, but when you put hops in it, you actually interrupt the fermentation process at the right moment and it really stays how it is. It doesn't ferment further on. So without hops, the ale actually becomes stronger and stronger with time and you wonder why a month ago you could drink two beers or three and then one is okay and then you don't remember anything more. <laughs> and one of the commercial aspects is because of this feature of stopping the fermentation process, you get more beer out of what you put in, which you can sell. So, makes sense. So, now we get a little bit more into the details. This was uh, getting warm especially me, it's sunlight here. So the word humulone, so I tried to pronounce it right, it's not humulone, it's humulone, from what I said before it comes from, I already forgot. Um, when it gets heated, you basically make beer by boiling it before you put it all into the other stuff. It develops iso-alpha acids. So on the right you see a molecule, and the overall size of this molecule is about one nanometer, so this is one thousandths, one thousandths, one thousandths meter, right? And the atoms, you see the grayish ones, carbon, red is oxygen, and the white little balls are hydrogen atoms. And this molecule um, 
I would say it's like a screw, it's chiral. And if you grow hops, you can be absolutely certain that it always has the same kind of screw sense all over the world. It's a so-called, well, kind of special thing of our universe that many of the biological things come only in one chiral sense, not in the other, unless you're a good chemist. I <laughs> think you can do a lot of things. So this small little tiny bugger um, is what we also call enunci pure. That basically means what I said before, it comes only in one hand, right? So if I don't tell you this is the right hand and that's the left hand, how would you know which hand this molecule have? So you have to investigate that with science. And people did that 40 years ago, and we will talk about whether they got that right. So we got these from the opposing word, the Greek enuncio, which makes, makes it interesting if you don't have to have to check this. Now, this is the same molecule. I made now a mirror image of the molecule. My mirror, you go from right to left hand, did this. And that's pretty obvious here on this picture, right? Okay, if I haven't told you from before what is actually the real chiral molecule, you wouldn't probably know you've forgotten. Um, but you see there are two versions. One can do good things, the other, we will see, may not do anything. So if you want to do signs with these molecules, you have to know well, which one of these pictures is the correct one, right? Or left. So let's go, making you a little bit further confused. Ah, now they look really similar. But the other one is still a mirror image of the one before. I just turned it around a couple of times because <laughs> I couldn't do it only once with PowerPoint. Um, and if you now look at, well, let's see if I get far enough. Now look at this kind of detail here which is a more interesting one. The same one is there. <sighs> if you look carefully at that, there's a slight difference. There are many differences in these molecules, but they can be kind of figured out by the molecule, by turning ligands around and so on. But this one, you can't do anything about it. That is a so-called chiral center, which indicates the chiral sense of this molecule. Once you got that one figured out, you know what hand of this molecule you got. So which of the two pictures represents the real humulone molecule? That's what the question it, um, addressed 40 years ago. Um, and we want to look at this in a more uh, general sense, why it is so important to know that. So well, let's talk about a story. We uh, have a space station, and we want to send up uh, the rocket and dock to it. Uh, we told the Russians a little bit uh, of the specifications of how to screw on to that space station, but someone actually made the photocopy of some of the things the wrong way around, and they fly up with the rocket, and they try to screw down on the space station, and oh, it doesn't work because they have the wrong sense of screws. I guess that goes into the news. In biology, it's a slightly different story. It's less spectacular or large, I would say. Our space station may be a protein, and you want to screw a, 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 see, a drug onto it, a drug molecule, like our humulone. So if that has the wrong sense, you can screw as you like, it wouldn't stick. And that was a general problem that people had when studying the humulone how, and its other molecules that come from it during the beer, pro uh, process, beer brewing process, how it ducks onto proteins. There's no study on that because it didn't work. People might have gotten the wrong hand. So I want to show a little bit what a docking study means in medical applications. And I found this beautiful um, presentation um, of uh, uh, a protein called thrombin, uh, which is responsible for thrombosis, blood clock. And to avoid that to happen, you have to disable it. And they figured out a drug that fits into this hole in the protein nut. And when it does that, the protein doesn't work that well anymore and you can't get the thrombose, uh, blood clot. So let's see how this computer simulation was done. 
and we want to look at particular details or oh, this is uh, these bonds here you see these three bonds are perfect fitting for our drug molecule to what the protein has the same positions but if you look careful they just optimize the shape of our drug molecule you know this is the one we want this one does the right trick it disables our protein and then you don't get the blood clog anymore if you have this so this is a so-called um, docking study which shows you how important it is to have the right sense of molecule if you don't have the right sense it's the wrong key it's not turning the key there where it's the wrong key it doesn't fit now for drug developers the problem is not only to find the right key but the one, the one key that fits only that particular molecule, uh, protein. So you might find a key that fits the protein, but it might fit another protein as well that you do not want to disable. So how do we actually find all these things out? Uh, how these molecules look like? Um, well, the experiment looks pretty simple. In this case, we use X-ray crystallography. It means we produce an X-ray beam its wavelength is pretty short, it deionizes uh, air, and it cuts through your finger, although you figure that out only a month later when it falls off, um, and then you are in deep trouble. You wouldn't believe it. Finger off is not the problem, it's all the forms you have to sign without that finger. <laughs> so here we have um, the x-ray tube, x-rays come out, you somehow make a beam out of it, you have this nice green crystal. Um, crystals are not always green. Okay, so they can have all colors. Then you have a screen, and you see dots on that screen. And these dots, <laughs> now this is an interesting picture, is a representation cutting through the upside down world of crystallographers. What happens is you're used to dimensions like uh, width, height, depth. Now, if you create a space where you divide everything by width, by height, and depth, you get a one by width, one by height, one by depth space, and that is the so-called reciprocal space. And that space is what you get if you do an X-ray experiment. So put the X-rays into the crystal, and out comes something that if you put that on a screen and look at it in different directions, it builds up kind of a different universe. And from these kind of universal pictures, we actually get structures of proteins and of little molecules that I will usually work with. What you need for doing this, though, are crystals. Now, if you want to make a crystal out of the stuff that comes from the Hops molecules, you first have to sort them out. So during the beer brewing process, you cook the Hops, and it smells nice, and it does good things to beer, but it is not no longer only the humulone molecule you have. Suddenly, you have a bunch of other molecules that look slightly different. Um, well, let's point it out here. You go here from six carbon atoms in a ring formation, and you get molecules that have only five. That's the basic difference. And that happens during your brewing of beer. You can't avoid it, but you need it. Well, this is the good stuff. That's the one, well, you know, hoppy tasting beers, they have a lot of hops, not so much of the so called iso alpha acids on the right here. But the alpha acids are what makes beer taste bitter and aromatic. It's a difficult word for a German. Um, so, how do I um, sort these kind of very similar molecules out? So, as constructed here, a picture, let's say the the little tiny girl on the left represents one of these molecules, and the little bit chunkier guy on the right represents another one. They are different. So you see they are different. So our molecules are less different, but they are different. Then you let these molecules, respectively these two guys, run through water. And obviously the baby doesn't get that far. It can swim, so don't, don't, don't be afraid. It can swim. But the uh, splashing guy comes further per time. And if you just wait long enough and then pick them out how far they come, you separated them by distance. right? And if you do that in a particular way, let's say you have a nice glass tube and let flow the 
a particular solvent and you put all your stuff that you got out of the hops on the top and after a while it will sink down and you just take out what comes first, that's one phase and the next one and so on. This is what people do, it's called counter-count chromatography and uh, the guys from the company insisted that I should show you these pictures. So I showed them. <coughs> now, it is a complicated machine. It actually has walls with tubings, and they go around, I think, like that. It doesn't tell me. I think it is like that. I haven't been at the company. I have that non-disclosure agreement. I can't go there. But anyway, at the end, you get these phases separated. Now, you've got them. Oh, you have to make sure that you really got the right stuff. So then you take the different phases, put them nicely in a solution, and send them to another company. Actually, they don't need a non-disclosure agreement. You just have to pay them for the work. And then they measure how much actually these chiral molecules turn light. That's the first time you physically see you have got a chiral molecule because it turns the linear polarization direction of light. Polarizer. Well, um, somebody has coffee? No. Pity. Oh, yeah. Now, look into the coffee, hold it to the water's light. You see a reflection. Yeah? yeah? If you had now a second cup of coffee, could turn it, then you would see, actually, depending on how you look at the two reflections from the two coffees, they would extinguish. Because the light coming from your coffee is linearly polarized, actually horizontally. So the light comes quarterly polarized to your cup, and then it goes like that, swinging towards your nose. It doesn't look different. It's still the same kind of light, but it, it's polarized. And if you have this plane and put this through a solution with these humulone derivatives and humulone itself, this plane will turn with thickness of light path. That's called optical rotation. It is characteristic for these molecules, specific if you put in a particular concentration and length and so on. But that angle is typically for these molecules. And then you know what you got. You just looked it up. Well, then you have to make a crystal. Now, as I said at the beginning, we were dealing with this subject for two and a half years. Yes, and we got seven different crystals, um, batches. And of, I think, Jan Orban tried about 200 or more crystal solutions until you got these few. They grow badly. Um, but once you got a crystal, uh, Here's a kind of an idealized representation of it. Um, you can do X-ray structure on them and find out the absolute configuration. That means the hand, provided, provided you put into the crystal something you already know. So if I take out of my workshop box a screw that I know the hand and grow it with another screw that I don't and do X-rays on them, I get a picture of the molecules. I just have to make sure that the picture of the known screw actually looks like the real one that I know is right, with the right sense. Then I know the other one is correct too. Yeah? So that's the easy thing. And we did that, but it's difficult to find the correct combinations that actually work. And we got only a few representatives. Well, once you've done that, um, you take this little crystal and then you mount this tiny little crystal that you have on the tip of a needle that actually is there. And then you put that here into the X-ray machine and then the X-rays come from here and that's the camera. And you have to cool it down also nicely and you get a lot of pictures. Well, you see this picture was taken as usual like, uh, guys, um, we are from the press, um, uh, press for the university. We're coming over in an hour, and I'm completely unshaved, and so on. <laughs> and out of focus, as you see here. So the diffraction pictures you get um, are pretty. Now, warning. Huge warning. Doing extra structures is highly addictive. It's a job you want never to stop doing, unless you can't get paid. So once you've collected a few ten thousands of these images, then you can take a big computer program and recalculate your structures, which takes time. But once you've got that, you get these beautiful molecules, and that's the same humulone molecule you just saw before. 
and I just took the humulone and didn't show the other one that came with this to define the handedness. And you can see this chiral center here again. Yeah. So that is what our humul humulone molecule really looks like. Oxygen top, the side chain on the bottom, these two oxygens on the top, and, and so on. So once you've got that right, you've got your key, and then you can actually use this in future to make these docking uh, studies and find out what this molecule actually can really do. So what happened when we wrote this paper and why I'm standing here? It basically is summarized here a little bit. So first we got the real configuration. We got the right hand. So 40 years ago the hand was determined, but they got it wrong. Um, not that they did bad work, but what happened was that the method they used is not, um, let's say, absolutely reliable. So for everyone who does biology, uses that other method, I don't need to really mention how it is done indirectly, uses this method to find absolute configuration, they get nervous because of the study, because they don't really trust themselves anymore. And then trouble they got with these wrong structures, right? And we made the biologists very, very nervous. Um, we got the right hand. Um, so a little bit about these things that happen during the brewing process. There's a fourth aspect of this work that we did. And uh, you would consider that in the, that the chemistry of beer, as such, despite the fact that they got the hand wrong should have been understood properly. So this is what the people knew beforehand. And uh, despite the fact that this is wrong, they figured out that the humulone goes to a molecule that has some specific chirality on that position. And we figured out, just to make it a little bit more specific what we do, I think I probably lost you at the fifth slide already, but never mind. I'm not a chemist, so it should be fine. And now we got this chiral center here. And uh, just to know that you understand this picture, so you have this big black wedge that basically means this oxygen group sticks up, where, uh, whereas everything that is drawn with kind of uh, dashed lines it fades into the back. Uh, that's how chemists help themselves to make uh, 3D pictures out of a two-dimensional plane that they're drawing on. And that's a kind of significant difference how this isomerization process, basically what happens when you boil the hops molecules, ha um, is going on there. So again, our paper. And um, now to the health aspect. The, our big mistake that made out famous with this paper was to write that humulone um, molecules and the derivatives have uh, some health benefits. Now, um, I summarize these health benefits up. On the left is how the medical folks put it. On the right is what I figured out it means. <laughs> I'm not going to read this. I probably won't get him the words right. Well, uh, anyway, you see, it's, it's good for everything. Well, you see, one of the most humorous things was that beer is actually seems to be good for losing weight. Uh, we come to this um, in, a, in a second. Um, so, <laughs> here we go. Don't get too thirsty. Yeah, in a day. And um, the, the reason for that is that when you make a beer, you can't make it so bitter that actually your spoon sticks up right now when you put it in. So there's a limit what you can do with beer. And um, 
So the typical concentration of these iso-alpha acids which have these health benefits is 50 milligrams or 15,000 gram and you need almost a gram. Um, so on ish, that's about 100 beers depending on how big your glasses are. In Cologne, your glasses are open two liters only, so you need 200 or so, 300 of them. That would have been a little bit of work to do. Um, so how you do this now is you actually don't do the hops in beer and then take it out again. You take the hops, the hops derivatives, you isolate the t correct iso-alpha acids that you want for making a drug and concentrate it. And then you uh, get some stupid scientists at the University of Washington to do the structures uh, and don't tell him everything. Uh, then he does that and then you ask him actually, oh, this is actually quite nice. Can you write the paper for us as well? <laughs> Which he does. And after th 30 about ish iterations between the company and, and me <laughs> writing this paper that took about six months, um, we then published it. Uh, they had to pay for me uh, me, pay me or ask the university to do the structures, uh, which means, uh, well, you have to comp get compensated for work you do, right? Then for writing the paper, they made a donation. That's the easiest way you want to support the university without running into trouble, and you get a tax relief for that. Um, and the time during when I uh, wrote this paper, Kindex was part of another company, and then they split up. This is also coming with this uh, kind of fame on this paper. These pr uh, products they build actually are pretty good and they hope with the understanding of which, which of these molecules actually are the good ones and how they look like and doing dogging stu stu studies with proteins to find out the ones which are really good. Um, so there are no tax pay, uh, uh, dollars wasted here. I think we gained from this research in a way that uh, we have now something that tells us that you can get healthy if you take, make, take the, the molecules out and make a drug. On the other hand, we also know that beer doesn't do any harm. And I thank you with that. <laughs>